hello everyone and I'm very pleased to present this conference this year and be part of the expert panel this year. So let's get it started. Um, I have experience in implementing um, complex decision intelligence pro uh, decision intelligence project across many different industries with many different use cases, product configuration, dynamic pricing, credit decisioning, fund management, eligibility, etc. Now, based on this experience um, of the around these projects and the fact that 80% of the AI projects are failing, which is a significant rate based on the RAND report, I decided to talk about the best practices and things that I learned during this implementation across uh, enterprise organizations, um, generally in BFSI, industry and government and health, to make sure we don't contribute in this 80% failure from now on. And we can make sure that our organizations and the customers and clients we work with get the most out of decision intelligence. And that really was um, the driver of this presentation. Um, so I'd like to start this uh, with a story, the elephant in the dark. Rumi, the great Persian Sufi and poet, has a story about the elephant in the dark. And the story goes like that. So if we put an elephant in the dark room and uh, we send people in the dark room and they try to identify what creature is in that dark room with feeling and touching different parts of the animal, they will have different assumptions based on their experience. If someone touches the tail and pull the tail, they may think that is a snake. Or if someone touches the ear, they may think it's a giant bird or big but, um, big uh, butterfly or fit my uh, feel like pillars. So depends on their uh, experience, they will have different assumptions. Now, the reason I share this is because the story of decision is exactly like that, particularly in decision intelligence, when we, in, we have many different um, stakeholders and many different professionals along the project. So one of the things that we noticed is that in order to make sure the decision intelligence goes the right direction, we need to have a methodology based on decision-centric approach, which is generally has three stages, uh, design, automation, and operationalization. And I'm going to share a couple of uh, best practices and things we learned uh, for each of these stages. So because of the nature of the decision um, and decision intelligence itself, because it was evolution through, as Jacob also mentioned at the beginning, uh, through different technologies, through different practices and disciplines, uh, we came to the place that nowadays uh, people, if they don't have like ourselves in this particular community, small community, I'd say, if they don't have experience with decision, um, they may think decision is something similar to what they know of based on uh, similar to the story of the elephant in the room. Um, decision intelligence is about decision, and when I'm talking about decision, I'm talking about the business decision. Hence, if people come from different areas, like we have uh, in our projects, people coming from a uh, process, and they think, okay, why not model decisions in terms of process and have gateways and all of those fun stuff? Or people from business rules area, they think business decision is business rules. I had many conversations over online uh, speaking engagement and customer client uh, relationship about data analytics and dashboard and data democratization and literacy. And they think better data and better quality of data makes them able to make better decision. Hence, the data um, is decision or dashboard is a decision. We almost certainly talk um, a lot with data scientist teams that they believe machine learning and algorithm of decision, which is quite um, opposite of, of what um, they believe. And all of these assumption is because this field um, pushed the boundaries of technologies and product categories, and now we're calling it decision intelligence. 
and has many different people and experiences and from different fields involved in this. So the first thing um, is uh, for ensuring that we understand what the decision is and how to model the decision, we need to make sure we are not using any irrelevant techniques or um, notation or even proprietary notation for modeling the business decision. And what we came to conclusion is decision model and notation, which we believe but outside this community is not so much popular, is the best option for modeling business decisions. Now, the first um, and most important part of um, experience and what we need to talk uh, and socialize between the project groups to make sure we get the impact for organization, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, um, is to make sure we explicitly model business decisions using open standard decision model and notation, not proprietary notation or process notation or anything else. So that's the first best practice, which is um, we may feel that's very obvious, but outside of this community, unfortunately, it's not. And the second part of decision intelligence is intelligence um, is not very profound. So the first part is decision and second part is intelligence. But um, when we're talking about intelligence and Jacob had a quite interesting take on this. So do we really mean um, intelligence in terms of emotional intelligence, in terms of creativity, in terms of problem solving? There are many angles and frames to the word of intelligence. Now, if we look at the adoption of the decision intelligence, it happens mostly in regulated environment, regulated um, environment and dynamic organizations operating in those regulated environment. And this narrows down to a very specific needs for intelligence. It should be based on domain expertise, it has to have the knowledge, embedded knowledge for operation and market knowledge, and it should evolve during the time and get mature over the time as we go on. And these requirements for intelligence needs design doesn't happen by accident. Now, in order to design this intelligence with these three characteristics that um, helps organizations, dynamic organizations in regulated environment, in changing environment, um, use AI for decision making. Uh, we have a framework called decision intelligence architecture, which helps them to get their head around, okay, so how do we trust this model? At what level do we add, uh, for example, LLM, or at what level do we uh, incorporate the uncertainty of the changing environment and so on and so forth. So decision intelligence uh, architecture allows them to put framework around designing intelligence for enterprise organizations operating in the regulated environment, which is banking, finance, uh, government, health, insurance, and all of those uh, generally bigger corporate organizations. Now, I'll go quickly touch on a couple of these uh, layers of decision intelligence architectures. It has five layers, two of them very fundamental and foundational to the rest of them. So we, we, start, uh, we start always with the knowledge core um, and then intelligence core. And then on top of that, we build expert intelligence, cognitive intelligence, and autonomous intelligence. Now, when we're talking about knowledge core, this is the core foundation for organization knowledge. It captures explicitly the terminologies, definition, concept, facts, and more importantly, business decisions that organizations make and execute. This explicitly capturing uh, models um, of the decisions and fundamental around those business decisions uh, includes the knowledge of domain expertise, operation, and market they operate. Now, the next level of the intelligence um, is intelligence core. 
which enables organizations to build the first intelligence level based on the knowledge core they captured previously using business rules and formulation and procedures. Um, this is a little bit significant to organizations because when we talk to customers, they're like, okay, how do we trust this AI? And um, recently um, there was a publication uh, that talked about the hallucination on, uh, on the LLMs. And I'm sure many of our are aware that that kind of hallucination is not necessarily a defect for that kind of um, approach. It's the byproduct of the design and architecture. And when we put that in the context of a regulated environment, it always becomes scary for our clients to trust um, uh, that kind of um, AI. And this is where the symbolic um, AI becomes significant in terms of um, gaining that trust. So at this level, intelligence, 100% um, explainable, explainable, reliable, safe to deploy in critical operation uh, and um, operate in the regulated and dynamic environment. Now, after this level, we get to the layers um, of more, uh, maybe from the uh, practitioners, more interesting combination of different techniques. Now, this is where we call expert intelligence. On top of the previous layer, it enables organizations to build intelligence that interacts with environment, senses, events, captures data. Essentially, we build agents, expert agents, that can reason and make sure the outcome of those decisions are optimized. More importantly, the decisions made at this level are optimized for goal and have a level of intelligence and ability to reason and plan. Now, on top of this level, we can deal with, uh, we can add up uh, layers on top of the layers to make sure we get to the point that everyone generally likes, but they start from the end of this um, design rather than starting from the beginning. And uh, again, I want to emphasize that this decision intelligence architecture gives them the guide and principle on how to design that intelligence um, that can be trusted in um, regulated environment for making decisions. Now, this level is called cognitive, cognitive intelligence. It enables organizations to make decisions based on future events so they can incorporate uncertainty, forecast, uh, and things that has not happened yet as part of the decision-making uh, models that they built. Um, and we can use many different techniques uh, here using, uh, for example, value prediction, classification, regression, etc. And um, the last one that we generally talk about is autonomous intelligence, which at this level, this is the agent that um, on top of the previous one, which was interacting with the environment and executing and becomes um, really self-sufficient agent. Um, now, at this level, that self-sufficient agent has a self-learning capability, which enables those agents to learn based on the impact of already made decisions, not any data. Sure, data is needed and everyone knows it, but most importantly, that uh, feedback loop incorporates the impact of the decisions already made to the um, agents and allows them to improve that over the time so the decision they make are better and better every day. Now, with this um, five layers of uh, architecture, decision intelligence architecture, um, what we can deliver is intelligence by design, which incorporates the domain expertise, operation and market knowledge for organizations that operate in the regulated environment and they are very dynamic in terms of uh, personalization responding to the market. Now that was the seven best practices on how to talk about intelligence and design intelligence um, that they can trust. So that was um, 
part of the decision intelligence architecture. We talked about the um, cognitive intelligence and expert intelligence, which requires essentially a model that incorporates multiple different techniques. And this is um, the part that it gets very interesting and everyone becomes excited about it. So um, a composite AI is uh, a way that you can incorporate multiple different techniques of business rules, machine learning, optimization, constraint programming, and et cetera. And also data access processing um, as part of one holistic model for decision uh, execution, a decision model that is executable and, it, and in, it, it incorporates multiple different techniques there. Now, the best way to design this model is to uh, distinguish between decision and orchestration, the design principle of separation of concern. Sure, we need orchestration, sure, we do decision modeling, but mixing them as part of one big model is not going to work out well because of the complexity increases exponentially. So I get question that I keep repeating about the regulated environment. I'll answer that um, in a second uh, when I, I go to question and answer. Thank you, Alex, for asking this. Um, now, this separation of the concern um, allows us to first build a composite model AI that is based on decision requirements diagram of the DM. And we use the same principle decomposing a complex business decision to smaller, easier to understand, reusable decision units. And this is how it looks like. Now, there are certain uh, things that we need to add on top of the decisions requirement diagram to make sure that it can reliably and easily work with different techniques uh, in terms of the decision units, um, but uh, we get to that point in a minute. Um, now, this decision graph is based on the decision requirement diagram, which represents a composite AI model. How? So, similar to a decision requirements diagram, you need to define the input. So, the structure of the input, the relationship of the input, uh, the constraint around the input and all of that. So once that input is defined, then each decision unit in a decision graph can be implementing different ways of decision. In this particular case, we're going to calculate the health premium, um, the COVID requirements uh, of the health premium is using the decision table. Um, now, decision uh, requirement diagram, which is a kind of a decision graph, a simplistic version of it. But uh, now in the decision graph, you can have situation of your decision. You, have, you can have events, you can process different things. Now, one of the benefits of the decision requirement diagram is that allows you to pull together different implementation. So for this instance, for example, income is using another forms of rule modeling, natural language, uh, to implement the rules around income. Now, this is where it gets interesting. If you look at the base uh, price calculation, now this decision uh, graph, um, which representing a composite AI uh, combining multiple different techniques, um, it actually incorporates a regression model um, that does the base pricing uh, as part of this uh, decision making for calculating the health premium. Now, this this uh, this regression can be bring uh, uh, your own algorithm and integrate it into here. Um, your platform might be able to train the model. However, it is now with this decision graph, you start combining more than business rules. You're incorporating uh, uh, machine learning for this example is a uh, regression model that is incorporated. Now, the other nodes of this decision graph can incorporate, for example, optimization and so on and so forth. Um, the point of having a decision graph and what we learned is we need to make sure that decision model, first, the separation of the concern, decision model from orchestration, and then second, 
uh, of that point is that decision graph should contains all of it. Um, yes, you can uh, separate the machine learning execution part, put it as part of the orchestration or do it before and pass the values to decision model out. But that breaks one fundamental point of composite AI, which is that decision model is a holistic model for every component of the decision making. So, so and it makes it easier when you look at it, it makes it more explainable as it is composable. And you can say at certain point what happened. And it's it gives you more visibility and transparency in terms of how did we make this decision when everything is inside that decision graph, including optimization, business rules, machine learning, and so on. So decision graph should contain it all. So the other part of this uh, design principle um, was the orchestration. So we separated decision and it contains all of different combination. And now the second part is orchestration model, uh, which there are many different ways of doing orchestration. Um, that's very interesting because um, sometimes, and we see quite a lot that this orchestration becomes a coding practice uh, within the team, whether data scientist team using Python or whoever uses whatever the coding language and programming language they're familiar with. And as also Jacob mentioned, now the point of decision intelligence is to make sure non-technical people um, can do it all. And then orchestration component of the decision intelligence becomes important because now we have an agent that requires to uh, communicate with different agents. So it requires orchestration between agents. It requires to go and grab data from operational database. It requires to ask human to give the input to overcome the inconclusive outcome of some part of the decision graph. So you can see now all of a sudden bringing every component together requires an advanced orchestration. And you'd better to have an advanced orchestration in terms of a visual way rather than the coding because uh, with DI tend to target more non-technical team uh, such as operation, SMEs, BAs, and so on and so forth. Um, coding approach in orchestration generally poses constraint in terms of understanding and delivery and all of the good values that we require to deliver that impact for organizations. And speaking of orchest orchestration, orchestration, there are so many things can go wrong with orchestration. Generally, we need to make sure orchestration is one of the most reliable components of the solution. Um, there are, therefore, that means when you integrate with data and services and stuff, you may not receive, for example, the response time in the same thing that you expected to receive because service is busy. They can send you the result particularly when you're interacting with orchestration to communicate with external services and online services. So you need to make sure that resilience and retry and exception handling are built in as part of your orchestration to make sure that doesn't fall into the crack. And as a result, the decision uh, can create the outcome reliably. And orchestration is a big thing uh, to make sure that reliability is built as part of orchestration. Now, baking reliability as part of the orchestration to incorporate um, a human uh, overriding a decision or adding extra information or providing the context or communicating with application and IT systems and processes and workflows and so on, that has exception handling, resilience, and retry should be part of that orchestration. Um, the last stage of decision-centric approach is operationalization. And what we've seen many, many, many times is this stage as operationalization um, is dumbed down to just deployment. So we deploy this to a service or whatever it is, 
and then we call it operationalization. However, there are many different points in oper operationalization can go wrong. Um, I just pick a couple of more important ones and how we can tackle them, and then uh, we uh, wrap it up quickly. Now, as part of operationalization, um, DI requires cross-team collaboration. And if the repository that we manage decisions are not the repository generally is using organizations, that makes the cross-team collaboration very, very, very hard. Now, the best thing to do to avoid this is to make sure that repositories of decision are generally the one that organizations use. And what are those uh, centralized repository for artifacts that they use in building systems? Git, any type of Git. So if we can make sure the artifacts of decision intelligence project are managed with centralized repository of Git, that makes the collaboration way, way easier in terms of many different aspects of the collaboration, including the deployment and automatic deployment. And speaking of the deployment, hence we want to make sure decision intelligence projects are managed in what we call decision ops. Decision ops has more responsibility than the um, DevOps. Um, but essentially, we need to make sure that deployment of decisions, the whole solution as, as the decisions, orchestration, and other components uh, can be done within the decision ops team, which they're not uh, literally software developers or IT architects and all those um, big brain people. Now, in order to make that happen, we need to make sure deployment also can be handed over to this decision ops team. And the reason is we don't want to wait for IT and software development team to deploy and incorporate the decision uh, model into the organization and operationalize it. And hence the changes happens, they need to do quite often uh, deployment of data change themselves. Now, speaking of the change, um, you may deploy the decision, okay, fine, but um, rule changes, data point changes, decision will be updating. Now, how can we make sure that we still get the um, best outcome from the decisions? You, you cannot go like big bang, the latest version of the decision is the best version. We don't know. The impact of the decisions are very hard to measure and requires certain amount of time to look at the outcome and understand whether this particular, for example, discount policy um, increased the revenue of organization or not at the end of the uh, season, right? Now, therefore, we need a way to securely and reliably roll out new versions of the decisions gradually. Now, that falls into the umbrella of adaptive control. So we might use a strategy like Champion Challenger to have a waiting on the new version rolling out gradually. Or in some environment, like in calculating tax, we need a very specific deadline that the next version automatically rolls out. Now, all of these what version and how we want to roll out and uh, based on the time or metadata or whatever it is, falls in the umbrella of the adaptive control, which is part of the operationalization. So if we dumb down operationalization, we will miss out on many things that we need to worry about and then we don't know where to fit them. Now, the last one uh, of these um, best practices is do not dumb down operationalization to just a deployment and make sure that all of it, collaboration, rollout, uh, deployment, all of those activities can happen in the decision ops team uh, and reduces the and reduce the reliance on IT and software development team. And now um, let's summarize what we discussed here. Now the two big part is having a methodology decision centric approach design intelligence, decision intelligence architecture. And within these two, 
um, explicitly designing business decision using DMN, not a proprietary or other notation for decision. Do not dumb operationalization. Make sure orchestration are reliable and visual. And composite AI, the decision graph should contain it all, including uh, machine learning, business rules, different types of it, uh, and uh, optimization. And with that, my presentation is done, and I'm open to answer any question.